we are located in Kiev, Ukraine, and we have war. Hey, what's up you guys? My name is Tyler Ruggie. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today I wanted to talk to you guys about and bring you into a conversation that I had with a group of people who are located in Kiev, Ukraine that run a very large reptile and I guess just animal breeding operation in general. And obviously they've been very devastated by what's been going on over there and very deeply affected. And they actually reached out to me and wanted me to have this conversation with you guys. They wanted to tell their story and how everything has affected them. They're also asking for our help. And I'm referring to Bion Terrarium Center, which is again located in Kiev, Ukraine. Some of you guys may actually be aware of Bion because they are a very large breeding operation. They've been around since 1993. They work with a very wide variety of reptiles from Euromastix, chameleons, uh, several different leaf tail species, just a lot of different types of geckos and reptiles in general. Also work with a lot of other animals other than reptiles, which you guys will see in this video. Their main reptile operation is located right in Kiev. So when Kiev was under attack, there was a period of time where they couldn't reach their breeding facility for days. No one was there to feed the animals, give them water, etc. And when they were finally able to make their way back into the center, they of course had to evacuate a lot of the animals and move them to their other facility. They have another facility, which is where they'll be at in this video today, which is located a little bit outside of Kiev. And due to everything that's been happening, there aren't planes going in and out of Ukraine. There's no way for them to ship animals. And because they make their income from selling and exporting animals, and they can't do that at all anymore, they don't have any way of making money. And getting the resources they need to take care of their animals has become increasingly difficult because of everything going on over there as well. So they're in desperate need of assistance. And if anyone can donate anything, I'll have all their information right here, as well as in the description on how you guys can donate and help them out. They're really just asking for money so that they can afford to feed their animals because, again, they're mostly relying on all of the reserves of money that they had beforehand, and that's not going to last forever. With all that being said, I was able to go on a Zoom call with Alexi from Biontarium Center, and he was kind enough to answer some questions and show us around their facility and kind of just show the state that their animals are currently in. They showed the area where they have the animals that they had to evacuate out of Kiev. I mean, this operation they have going on over there is truly incredible. Yeah, without further ado, let's go check out Bayon. Hi, Tyler. Hello, how's it going? Fine, can, can you hear me? Yes, I can. So uh, we are in our responsible zoo culture center and I'm 100% ready to answer all your questions. <laughs> All right, awesome, sounds good. Just to start out, maybe you wanna introduce yourself and just explain. My name is Alexey Marushak. I am head of research and development department of uh, Bayon Terrarium Center. This is the international center uh, that is uh, specialized in uh, breeding of uh, reptiles and small mammals. We are located in Kiev, Ukraine, and we have war just around us right now. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So that's why we basically uh, are trying to uh, tell as much as possible about uh, organizing this uh, activity in terms of war because I, we are now trying to survive and we are ready to show what is going on right now. So I definitely want to go into how everything that's been going on over there has been affecting you guys. But first, just to get some like background and just for anyone who doesn't know, you know, about Bion, obviously I'm familiar with you guys, but like what like what animals do you guys work with? What are your goals? Like what kind of things do you guys do typically? I will show you, I think most of our animals and uh, it is just a uh, feeding time here. Uh, and I think it will be interesting for you. Uh, just a few words uh, where we are. So this, uh, so actually right now we are not in the, in Kiev. We are uh, outside Kiev, uh, I think 30 kilometers far from, from the city. Another uh, facility for small mammals where we evacuate part of our collection. We still can hear bombs. Anyway, we can still uh, see some rockets uh, flying above our heads, unfortunately. But here it is uh, more, or less, more or less safe uh, and uh, part of our collection, as I mentioned, was evacuated here. And here is uh, some of our animals. 
First of all, I would like to show you our uh, facility for Rhinocera Simona, Ciclura Cornuta. So we are trying to do our best to breed these guys. Don't, don't be nervous. <laughs> I'm his girlfriend, so he's nervous, obviously. Yeah. Yeah, so this is our uh, facility for these amazing lizards. Um, uh, we witnessed several uh, populations this spring. Yeah, because they don't uh, they don't know about the war <laughs> outside here. Yeah. yeah, and they live in their normal uh, routine life. So here we have a breeding group of one male and three females. So male, female, another female is sitting there, and uh, the fourth one, uh, I think she is. Ah, don't try to escape. <laughs> Not now. Yeah, and uh, the fourth one is sitting right there. Uh, we have several other breeding pairs and groups, and uh, I hope that this year we will uh, be, be very lucky to see first fertile flushes. That's well, awesome. Yeah. Uh, we have several big lizards and also um, small mammals. Now I will show you uh, our uh, real star. It's a king caju, or uh, as far as I remember, the English variant, honey beer. Let's go. This is Dmitry and he is director of our uh, uh, of uh, Bio Center. And uh, as you probably understand, not all of our uh, staff are able now to work with animals because some of them allocated their um, families, their kids. Uh, to the western part of Ukraine because here it is quite dangerous and our director is working with everybody doing the same work as all of us. Yeah, yeah. so this is uh, one of our Lemurcata. Uh, yeah, one of our Lemurcata uh, females. And during the past uh, months during war, we already have four beautiful babies. Wow. He is just uh, licking some milk from his mom. That's cute. That's this is awesome. His <laughs> yeah. That's so cute. We have many more of them. Yeah, we have many more of them. I will show you later. Okay. Um, this is our actually bigger facilities for uh, body lemur. So uh, black and white worry, as far as I remember. Uh, one of the females is now pregnant on the very last stages of her pregnancy and she will give birth, I, I, I think tomorrow or, or probably this night, I have no idea. Oh, wow. She's really uh, like on the very limit of her pregnancy. Follow me? Yes, here we have a big group of big tortoises. Sulcata tortoise uh, that is, I think, quite common in USA. Uh, actually, I, I just saw a lot of pictures from different Facebook groups. Uh, yeah. Actually, this, they were rescued from our small zoo. We have a small zoo in Kiev. And uh, the very first days of the war, we had to rescue the animals because uh, the whole, um, this, the big mall where the zoo was situated, uh, it was uh, switched off from electrical supply and uh, it was February here, so all the animals, they were, uh, they had, if nothing changed, they could die, but we evacuated everyone and uh, wow. the bar here we have tortoises, parrots, uh, small mammals like ferrets, fennec foxes, mangoes. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, I will show you, I, I, will, I, will show, I will show them to you. Here we have our big facilities for the moons. Most of them also breed. So we provide uh, uh, also captive bred babies. Uh, uh, and we can, uh, we also can legally sell them actually because the main, uh, like the main uh, source of money for us in peaceful time is selling of uh, healthy captive bred mammals and reptiles. All of the, uh, all the animals that you see, they have pro proper documents, so it's not a result of smuggling or something like that. So right. all of them were exported with legal yellow paperwork. And this is extremely important because 
a lot of our, um, like not subscribers, but a lot of people on the internet think that, okay, uh, Ukraine, where is Ukraine? It is somewhere in Eastern Europe. There is no law in Eastern Europe and everything here is the result of smuggling. That's not true, obviously, and yeah. we are the example for this. Awesome. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, there you can see the female I, I, I told you about. You can make it like this. Oh, yeah. She is pregnant. Uh, uh, and she has, like, licked away all fur from her belly. And she is, like, she's ready to give birth in, I think, in, in a couple of days. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. Yes. Um, also, we... Uh, so here we, uh, what I'm showing you right now is the facilities that already were here. So uh, these these animals, uh, except tortoises and um, some lizards, they they already lived here, and uh, these facilities they they were built for these animals to breed. Uh, later, I will show you the, some of the rescued animals, more rescued animals, and now still about something about breeding. Here we have a uh, breeding group of Philippine seraphim lizards. Uh, I think that uh, Master will show you. Here is the. Can you see her? Yeah. Yeah, it's a big, it's a big Hitrosaurus postulatus. I don't know uh, how it is better to. Is it better to mention Latin name or common names for your subscribers or both, or, or you don't care? Probably both would be good. I know a lot of people go with the Latin name, but the common name might be more familiar for some people. Right. If you if you need some some uh, supporting information, you can uh, write down. I will uh, write Latin names. Uh, okay. Uh, so again, the big facility for our sailfin lizards. Here is the male. Uh, he's really huge. Wow. Yeah, yeah. he's huge. But, uh, yeah, he has some troubles with his jaw, but uh, it's uh, it's not a stomatitis. He just uh, they just like to uh, to jump from this tree uh, somewhere to the screen, and they of course kick their um, their noses. But I think uh, but it, it doesn't uh, cause a lot of problems. Yeah, and this year again we got first fertile clutch from them. Actually, fertile clutches, not one. Uh, it's here. So their eggs that we excavated like uh, these two um, one month ago and these two uh, two weeks ago. Yeah, okay. You can see the size difference. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, just to um, to give you some. Uh, numbers. Last year we produced more than 1,200 captive bred reptiles. I mean mainly wow. small reptiles, so uh, leopard geckos, breasted geckos, whale chameleons, uh, and uh, uh, leaf-tailed geckos, of course, because yeah. um, the person who is now hanging the camera, my wife, Anastasia, uh, she is uh, a real goddess of uh, breeding uh, Uroplatus species. And oh, last yeah. year got like, uh, I think more than 300 uh, captive bred babies. And wow. I'm sure, but probably we are, at least in Europe, I'm not sure about America, but in, at least in Europe, we are probably one of the biggest uh, uh, company who, and the biggest like, source of captive bred uh, leaf-tailed geckos. Yeah, that's incredible. I, I was actually looking, before all this happened, I was looking into your Giganteus actually, because I have a, I have a male, so I was looking for a female before. And Which yeah, one? Giganteus. Ah, Gigant, yeah. Yeah, but yeah. <laughs> we have some of them. Uh, they are now recovering from the translocation because yeah. um, I will tell you the story a, a little bit later. Yeah, definitely. Here, uh, the big group of uh, ring-tailed lemurs, lemur wow. all of them are bred. I think 12 of them are here. 
and uh, it might uh, look as uh, it is easy to read them. That's not true because uh, they have a very complicated social structure of their groups. So, so they have to uh, have dominant uh, individuals, subdominant individuals, and so on and so forth, like for the group to live together in harmony. And our uh, and people in our staff, they really know how to form this group, how to form breeding group, and how to organize everything in the way so they, that can, uh, they can live uh, peacefully together. They have meal now. They had meal. Not. That's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, you also have to understand that these uh, these are the uh, inner facilities, so they are inside the building, and we also have outer facilities where they uh, can uh, uh, like do basking or uh, having rest under the sun. Yeah, uh, I will show. To you later because uh, today it is still quite cold outside it's like plus plus 10 or plus 12 degrees celsius which is uh, low for them but anyway if we have a sunny day they uh, like to like having rest and playing on the branches outside under under the sun let's go um oh, there's a black water monitor wow uh, this is a male. Um, uh, what else? Yeah, and you can realize how big his facility is. So that's me. Yeah, Compare that's incredible. The, <laughs> the size of the facility. Yeah, that's awesome. I love that. Wow. Um, here is our uh, kitchen where we prepare food for our animals. So you can see how <laughs> everything is cooking. Yeah. Yeah. This is. Uh, yes. Oh my this god. Her uh, stuff. Her name is Alla, and uh, she is the person I told you about. So she is uh, responsible for breeding of lemurs and small uh, and small mammals. Uh, this is uh, uh, tamarin. Uh, I don't. I don't remember uh, the Latin name, unfortunately. But uh, this is a female who was born uh, this year earlier. But unfortunately, her mother, uh, when she uh, was given a birth, she uh, cut down her tail, and so now the you know, this small uh, egg is uh, on adaptation, and always taking care of her. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and we have uh, so here the, uh, pygmy <laughs> Yes, she's all, she wow. was also here. That's so cute. Yeah. Wow. Ты скажи, что от этой обезьянки отказались люди два года назад. Yeah, uh, this um, so uh, this uh, marmoset. Uh, uh, we didn't export it. Uh, it was it was captive bred, but um, her uh, previous owners, so other people somewhere in Kiev, uh, uh, sometimes they use our small zoo like to uh, like to to leave uh, the animals in it and uh, don't care about it because uh, we also are ready to adopt uh, some animals, some really uh, exotic animals. Yeah, uh -huh. and this is. This marmoset is also one of the one of the animals who was adopted, and you know you see she's quite tamed. So yeah. Uh, additionally, I told you about parrots. We have green uh, Amazon parrots. Uh, one is here. One is here. Um, our uh, also uh, this is a kakadu, white kakadu. Uh, he also was brought uh, to the zoo by his previous owners, and of course we adopted him. Yeah. Yeah. Now he is a little bit shy right now. Uh, Hello. Yeah. Uh, and this is our, one of our facilities where we. Um, uh, translocated our uh, almost all our 
a collection of uh, leaf tail geckos. Uh, this is a permanent, uh, no, not permanent, this is a temporary uh, place for them because as you can see, we don't have lamps here, we don't have UVB here and, uh, and so on and so forth because uh, we had to be in a big, big hurry while evacuating them from Kyiv. Actually, Pionterarium Center, uh, you can see it on our on many of our videos on our YouTube channel, uh, it is situated right down in downtown of Kyiv. So, right in the middle of Kyiv. And in the, I think on the second and th third day, we had a uh, heavy uh, uh, combating right in uh, 200, 300 meters from Bayonne. So for the first five days, we were unable to reach our workplace at all. Uh, first of all, because some of our staff was evacuated. Some of us lived on the other uh, side of Kyiv. So the Kyiv is divided by the Dnieper River, and we are on uh, left bank, we live on left bank, and Bayon is situated on the right bank. And due, uh, due to the fact that bridges were blocked by army, by, uh, by the needs of martial law and curfew, uh, metro stations were used as uh, bomb shelters, so we were totally unable to reach our uh, workplace. And on the sixth day of war, we finally managed to uh, get inside, and you can understand what is going on with leaf-tailed geckos when they're not um, watering properly. Yeah. So when humidity is low and nobody uh, was there to like to water them, to mist them, we don't have automated systems because uh, it is uh, super expensive, and uh, I don't think that it would work in this way. Uh, actually, our only luck was that the electricity was still on. And all our desert species, all our species that uh, heavily depend on uh, heating sources, they survive. But uh, all our water plateaus were heavily dehydrated and Anastasia all made everything that was possible and everything that was impossible to, uh, like to save the collection. Um, we also evacuated from Kiev, so me, Anastasia, and uh, another guy from our staff, and we are leaving like two villages from here. So we are uh, able to, we were able to take care about the animals. So we decided to evacuate them here. Unfortunately, uh, about 60, uh, any, 60 geckos were lost. So they died, unfortunately, due to or direct dehydration or subsequent problems. So for example, when we gave them a lot of water, uh, the, anyway, not, not a lot. So we gave them water or ringer solution they unfortunately um, uh, started to have problems with shedding, and you know what means shedding problems to Uroplatos. Yeah, but still, the biggest part of our collection is saved. Some of them already have laid eggs. I, I'm talking about our Uroplatos Fantasticus and Uroplatos Ebenaui. So first clutches are here. It's okay. just the very beginning. We hope to uh, have like, 200 eggs this year, I hope, probably more. But wow. I have absolutely no idea how the female, uh, how the pregnant, how graduate females will respond to this amount of stress. So yeah. it's like 50 might be everything OK, and they don't care about it. Uh, or they might they might like, rib, r mm, like absorb the eggs inside, and they might lose some clutches. But uh, anyway, we do all our best to to continue this process. Uh, yeah. Actually, part of these animals are already captive bred. So uh, they are already uh, like F2 generation. So they their uh, parents were captive bred at Bayonne, and only the parents of their parents were uh, exported from Madagascar like six years ago, 10 years ago, or something like that. Uh -huh. Yeah, so we are trying to like establish, you know, a big breeding group uh, that will give us um, enough captive bred babies for sale and enough captive bred babies for uh, repairing of our breeding stock. Yeah. So let's, go, let's go further. I will. Uh, wow. I hope that uh, in in a couple of weeks we will uh, get back to Bayonne uh, because uh, I think here it is. It is good for them here because as soon as soon as uh, uh, it is cold outside, 
as soon as we will have like plus 25, plus 30 outside, uh, I'm not sure that we will be able to maintain necessary low temperatures here. And you told about Europlatus giganteus, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, these are the babies uh, from our 2021 breeding season. Uh, Anastasia wanted to show uh, her results. This is a captive bred female. Oh, wow. Really nice one. That's so cool. Yes. And uh, let me. Oh, this is also female. Uh, this is a male. Yeah, and this, is, this one is a male. Wow, that's beautiful. Yeah, they also recovered uh, from from the dehydration, and now they are doing good. So most of them are are okay. They shedded, they uh, eat on their own. So I hope that we will survive this. Uh, yeah. Yes, a moment. Um, uh, here we have uh, fennec foxes that we also rescued from our zoo. Uh, by the way, we are uh, one of not many uh, places uh, in the world where they are. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. It's They're so cute. Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, we breed them. They are extremely difficult to breed, as far as I know from the literature from uh, from Facebook, but. Uh, in our facilities, we already had like three or probably five babies. I don't really remember the exact figure. Okay. Here we have um, some of our uh, big leaf tail geckos. So I think that you know uh, Oroplatus hankeli up here. Yeah. Look at this beautiful female. Whoa, that's she so cool. captive bred at Bayonne, uh, and we try to establish this uh, peabald line, like to uh, get more and more peabalds. Uh, we are not very strictly like attached to, uh, you know, breeding of designed morphs or something like that. But if we can, why not? Uh, they are still healthy. They are still good. Yeah. Her, uh, her mail. Uh, we have some um, some other morphs of Henkeli. Uh, Gigantos. Ah, gigante oh, sorry, this is Gigantos. I'm sorry, I didn't. Uh, yeah. One of our old males. Yeah, he is. And he's uh, on some of our pictures. That's cool. Well, yeah, unfortunately, the Gantels are the ones who uh, like uh, who had the, the biggest problems with uh, shedding after um, after this transportation, and they are still recovering. It is very slowly, it goes very slowly, and yeah. I must see, show you uh, how they're doing now. This wow. is one. Yeah, I hope that if we survive, if everything is good and we uh, will not become bankrupt, because as far as because as I mentioned before, uh, the only way for us to earn money was legal selling of captive bred reptiles and mammals, and now it is absolutely impossible due to. Uh, absence of flights, so no airlines are now servicing in Ukraine for obvious reasons. Nobody yeah. wants the repeating of uh, MH17 flight tragedy in 2014 when um, when a civil aircraft was shut down with the rocket from Russian side and a lot of uh, people uh, died. I think uh, 270 people died. So our uh, air is now closed. No airlines are operating. So we are now just surviving uh, on our reserve funds. Uh, it was uh, it, it was hard in uh, 2020 uh, due to coronavirus uh, pandemia when when we 
like uh, have to uh, to send one shipment with uh, animals i think in one month uh, and it is not enough for us of course and now we have no opportunity to ship at all so that's why we are asked for donations that's why we are asked for uh, we are we are asking for uh, help. We are we have launched our online um, uh, project, responsible herpetoculture project. I think that you heard about it, mm -hmm. uh, where we uh, try to like share our experience in breeding, keeping, and uh, operating in any ways with uh, different reptiles, uh, because I, we believe that it is it is very important for people uh, all over the world because. Um, uh, if you want to breed some species, you need to like to collect a puzzle. If you and you have to have all the all the parts of this puzzle. I mean, proper humidity, proper diet, proper winter dormancy, proper incubation approach, and so on and so forth. And as much information we share, uh, so the, the the more information we share, the more possibilities we would be for hobbies like you, like me, like everybody. All over the world to breed the species they want or to i don't know to probably solve some problems that they couldn't solve mm -hmm. uh, can you can you now see me or you have troubles with uh with the video oh i can see you okay. yeah great uh now we will go uh to the second floor uh and I'll show you more levels so this is another happy mama with her uh, cow. Uh, I think that she will let me in. But I'm going to have some nice food. Bon appetit. <laughs> and you can see the baby near her. Oh. Yeah, I eat banana. They're so cool. Yeah, she's tamed. She's absolutely fine with me, like filming video right now. Yeah. The only thing she's she, she cares about is her meal. So. <laughs> so okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's really cool. I didn't realize. I knew you guys worked with all the reptiles, but I didn't realize how many different mammals you guys worked with. Yeah, we have because like here we have more mammals. Uh, and yeah. Other uh, most of our reptile collection is uh, at Bayon in Kiev right now, and they are not there. Yeah. Anyway, I am ready to as soon as we will be there. I'm ready to make you some video and probably on my on my own with my camera, and we can make another stream. Uh, okay. Yeah, something like that. Uh, if you need some additional video about our reptiles, I have a lot of uh, previously filmed moments. Yeah. Copulation, egg laying, incubation, hatching, whatsoever. I can send it to you in, uh, uh, through my uh, Google uh, services. And um, another uh, facility here is facility for reptiles. Here we have uh, Australian water dragons, also breeding group of one male and uh, three females. Oh, wow. Additionally, we have here a crocodile monitor. This is a young female. She is a little bit crazy, so we won't open the, oh, we won't open the door. Yeah. Um, Rangers. Uh, uh, here we have uh, uh, spiny tail iguana tenosaura pectinata. These are pebbles. I posted some uh, some videos about them. One of our females recently laid uh, 20, 27 eggs, but unfortunately they appeared to be infertile. So mm. we are waiting for another two to lay. Yeah, and here we have also rescued Basiliscus plumipans. They were also rescued from the from from the zoo, and female is probably gravid already, as far as I can see. 
Yeah, and we will, I hope that we will also have some eggs from here. Yeah, so I can also show you several more uh, saves here. There are also some snakes that we rescued from our friends uh, because a lot of people were evacuated and they had no uh, possibility to take their animals with them uh, because they were they were driving to actually nowhere and they didn't really know if they have the uh, possibility to take care about their reptiles. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So here. Uh -huh some sort of, uh, let us say, Spartan or uh, minimized conditions, we try to care about these animals. Yeah, we know that this is not the best way to keep them, yeah. but we have no uh, choice and we have to, like, we have to do what we can. Right, so, yeah. I would like to, like, to place them in big um, decorated terrariums with a lot of equipment, with a lot of different food, but unfortunately, we do what we can. Yeah, um, definitely. So now basically that is almost everything. Uh, if you have any question, I'm, any questions, I'm ready to answer. Going to like when everything started, you know, like at what point did you guys realize that, you know, like it wasn't good and you were going to have to leave and you're kind of in trouble? Like, like, what was that like? And like, you know, like at what point did that happen? Actually, um, you know, uh, we didn't believe that uh, the war might start it till the very last minute. Mm -hmm. Because actually, um, living in Ukraine is, uh, <laughs> is, uh, is full of fun uh, all the time. So basically, we have war since 2014, when uh, part of our territory was uh, uh, invaded by uh, our neighboring country, bigger neighboring country, when we had revolution. And since then, we have like continuous, uh, small, um, not small, continuous, slow um, conflict somewhere in the east. And we are in Kiev, uh, so far to the northern part of Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, uh, du du um, during these eight years, we got used to this situation. So we permanently had some war conflict somewhere to the east. But nobody really believed that in 21st century, some uh, um, country can invade another country can try to invade another country and uh, start uh, a real war uh, in the middle of Europe. Uh, nobody believed in it. So we had some warnings from our, from, uh, our partners. So we had some information about the fact that uh, military uh, machines and military forces are uh, gathering in, uh, in front of our borders in Belarus, in Russia, in other parts near Black Sea, but we didn't believe. And uh, for us, it was, for a whole world, it was nonsense, like the war in the middle of Europe in the 21st century. And uh, on 24th of February at uh, 4, uh, 4.30 a.m., uh, we woke up uh, because uh, our city, so Kiev, was bombed. Mm -hmm. uh, we had no idea what to do. Actually, uh, uh, we had collected uh, emergency kits. Uh, like they were prepared like just for fun, so nobody really believed we, that we would need them. Yeah. But uh, when we heard first explosion, explosions, uh, we were scared, of course. We were disorganized. We uh, were uh, we were shocked because uh, because nobody knows what to do when you are uh, hearing an explosion right yeah. near you. Of course, we know some basic principles. So you should lie down. You should go to bomb shelter. You should cover your heads with your head with your hands, and and so on and so forth. So, so we know these basic principles, but. Uh, just imagine that uh, we had to go to bomb shelter every 30 minutes. We live on the 17th floor. You can imagine this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and uh, it, no, so it, it was nonsense. Uh, what if we tell about uh, Bionterrarium Center? Of course, all of all members of our staff all, all felt the same as I just described. Uh, they were frightened, they were scared, they were shocked. Uh, some of them uh, were, they, they evacuated their children, their families to the Western Ukraine. 
uh, at the very first days, I mean, uh, when we managed to reach our workplace, because it is very hard. So there is uh, problems, there, uh, there are big problems with fuel, there are problems with municipal transport, there are problems with crossing the river through the bridges, because as I mentioned, uh, they were blocked due to martial law and curfew. Uh, you hear air raid sirens every 30 minutes. And uh, for the first several days, uh, the, I mean, seventh day, eighth day and so on, our uh, members of staff, they have to hide uh, uh, at the basement where we have uh, our uh, food department. So where we breed crickets, cockroaches, the four bus, uh, rodents, etc. So we have to go there every, every 30 minutes as soon as we hear uh, the air raid siren. And you can imagine what, um, what it was like. Yeah. Um, yeah, so. Nothing good about it anyway. Yeah, no, definitely. So when, when everything started, was there basically like no warning? Like you couldn't, was it just like when everything started, you couldn't go to your facility for five days or were you able to go at some point to kind of prepare to not be there for a while? Or was it just no warning and you couldn't be there for X amount of days? So for some days, yeah, we, we were unable to reach the to reach Bayon. Uh, on the second day, me and my wife we evacuated uh, here, so, so to the village that is near uh, the facility where we are now. And uh, yeah, and then our director uh, took us with the car, and we decided to like to evacuate most of our animals and do our best to take care about them. It was quite hard because uh, it was quite hard because uh, uh, there are a lot of blue posts uh, on the road and there, there there is a lot of heavy traffic uh, on the road. So mm -hmm. the so to like to pass uh, thirty kilometers, it took uh, it took us like two and a half hours, three hours just taking in the traffic. Because everybody is panicking, everybody go, is going outside Kiev, inside Kiev. So it's yeah. Stuff. And of course, uh, we, we were. So the second shock was that uh, the Russian troops are coming inside the Ukraine from the north, so from the Belarus territory. And actually, they are not somewhere far on the east. They are actually in our. In, they are actually like thirty kilometers from Kiev or fifty kilometers from Kiev. And it was like it was additional uh, threat to us, uh, but somehow we managed to uh, to do it because uh, everybody is united, everybody is uh, joining, everybody is uh, trying to help everybody. And this is real. Yeah. Wow. So once so once you were able to access the facility again for the first time after I think it was five or six days. Um, what was like the first thing you guys did when you got back there? Were you just kind of trying to give everything food and water and check on everyone? And did you kind of start evacuating animals right away? Or like, how did that go? No, actually we had, so we had some sort of plan because some of our uh, workers, uh, three of them, they uh, were, they uh, decided to be volunteers to live in a shift uh, at Bayonne for three or five days. I don't, I don't really remember. So we took them, we took some food for them. And they were volunteers like to take care about the animals. And they, they are real heroes. Uh, wow. So we put them inside. First of all, we uh, checked all the animals. So who is dead, who is dehydrated, who is uh, doing more or less well, for example, if we tell, if we, if we are talking about desert species, they were fine because they don't need a lot of water and they find uh, without water yeah. for a long period of time. Uh, of course, we saw leaf tailed geckos that were dehydrated and they were uh, chosen as the first animals to evacuate and uh, to because we were unable to operate with them. We have more than 2,000 animals uh, at Bayonne and Two people and, and uh, two uh, and two people who are there uh, on the ship. They anyway would not be able to uh, work with all these 
massive of animals. Uh, mm. Yeah, so we evacuated the animals that are the most sensitive to the uh, humidity uh, and uh, that are generally the most sensitive. And uh, we uh, left those who are like more tough. Uh, and uh, slowly uh, our staff become, uh, so started uh, coming back to Kiev. And now almost all are working, almost all per personal, uh, almost all women personal is working uh, so with the animals. And this is really cool because we managed to like, not uh, just help them to survive, but to continue our plan with breeding. So waking up blue tongue skinks, uh, placing them together. We saw copulation uh, already. I made a post on Facebook. Uh, again, uh, forming pairs and breeding groups of uh, nucleophilus species. Again, we have a lot of eggs now. So in all this chaos, we are doing our best, like to stay in line and to, uh, to follow our plans. <laughs> yeah, it sounds weird, but we, we can't do anything else. Uh, yeah. Additionally, we have uh, uh, in other city that is now uh, not occupied, but uh, there are heavy uh, combating near the city. Uh, city of Kharkiv. It is to the east of Ukraine, and our big partner and friend, Sergei Prokopyev, who also operates together with us, he is one of the biggest breeder of whale chameleons, uh, also um, jeweled lizards, Timon Libidus, and uh, crested geckos. Uh, right now, his house is uh, far, is on the front line. So during these 51 days or 52 days of war, he, could, he couldn't and he still can't reach his uh, facilities, unfortunately. His uh, wife, Nelly, Nelly was she is she, still there. She is taking care about the animals and she refuses to leave the house uh, as soon as there is at least one alive animal inside. Uh, the whole village where this facility is was bombed down, so there are no uh, like uh, no houses, almost no houses there. All of them are bombed or uh, damaged in, in different ways. Uh, and she's still there and she takes care about uh, the animals. Lotan skins, geckos, jeweled lizards and whale chameleons. We don't know how many died. We don't know how many survived and we don't know the situation because we can't go there because there is a front line and soldiers from both sides shooting each other. And uh, actually, I'm, I hope that it will be um, very soon so that we can, uh, that Sergei can uh, go and check his facilities. Uh, but at, at the same time, I'm, I'm afraid of what we will see there. Uh, yeah. This is, this is terrible. Yeah. Yeah, that's crazy. So. Yeah, and uh, you can imagine, sorry, you can imagine how many, how much uh, food, how much uh, electricity all these, uh, all these uh, facilities consume, all these animals consume, I mean mammals, I mean <coughs> reptiles also. So that's why we collect donation because, uh, for example, lemurs, they have to eat like uh, two or three times a day and uh, everything here of course, we give our support to Sergei as, as we can. Yes, as much as we can. Yes, yeah, so that's why we are, we, we are forced to, uh, to, to ask for help. Thank you. Yeah, I was also gonna ask, um, like in, obviously it's affected, everything that's gone on has affected you because you weren't able to reach the facil facility physically and you can't sell things. Like you mentioned, you can't ship stuff. So has it also been more difficult to get supplies for the animals because of everything going on, like to source like feeders and just everything that you need to take care of everything? Yes, of course, of course. Uh, we experienced a lot of problems with food supply. If we, if we talk about um, uh, like uh, fruits, uh, vegetables and grass and, green, and different greens, uh, uh, it was February, it was early spring, so we can't uh, get them from the countryside. So all of them, uh, so uh, uh, it was very hard to get the greens from the market because 
during the first days, almost all food from the markets, from big supermarkets, it was uh, bought from, it was bought by the citizens, by the evacuated people. You know, this, um, I, I don't know how to explain this syndrome of, uh, in, uh, of Ukraine and uh, post-Soviet uh, countries when something goes wrong, you have to collect all food you can and uh, store it somewhere and hide it somewhere because yeah. we have we experienced two hungers or three hungers, several wars, and this syndrome it, it's it's it is in our blood in our genes. So uh, when something goes wrong, uh, the first thing that you face are empty uh, shelves uh, in the market. So we were unable to buy greens, to buy food, to buy vegetables. We had some storages, but they were eaten like during the first during the first week, I think. Yeah, and then we try to uh, like to to search in the nearest villages in ordinary people who, for example, have some uh, some extra uh, vegetables, some extra fruits, and we bought them uh, for our animals. Uh, of course, we also had to buy, for example, frozen uh, salad mix. Uh, it is, I think, two or three times more expensive than. Uh, than actual fresh greens that mm. we can buy. Yeah, so we uh, we were running out of money very quick. If we tell, uh, if, we, if we are talking about insectivorous uh, uh, animals, I mean, most of our lizards, it also was a problem because um, we actually are the biggest facility who produces up to 2 million crickets uh, per year. And uh, I think, I mean, only crickets, I, I'm not counting cockroaches, uh, zoophobas, and other food items. Yeah. And uh, we have no other facilities, no other person who can produce at least a half of what we need per month. Uh, so we are the only uh, source of uh, insects for us, I mean, in, uh, in, uh, proper, in uh, proper quantities. And uh, during these uh, first days, uh, um, a person uh, who works with insects at Bayonne, he also was unable to reach Bayonne. And you know this uh, uh, this production line of crickets. So when you have a small egg, and when you have uh, an imago, so the big uh, cricket that is readily eaten by by a lizard. Uh, so from the egg to the imago, it uh, sometimes goes like one month, one month and a half or something like that. So we, during the first days, uh, we had to use all we have. I mean, breeding stock, farm stock, uh, raising uh, insects on different uh, stages of their lives because we need to uh, like to maintain our animals. And when yeah. this guy who is responsible for breeding of the insects finally reached uh, Bayonne, uh, it took him one month like to to repair all the cycle to repair all, all the line because uh, we had to take care of the animals at the first place and we didn't think about uh, about these lines because we just we had no we, we, we had no other uh, suppliers of insects uh, well but still still we are now we are more or less uh, good with the insects but if something goes wrong with, for example, another uh, another uh, part of this siege of this uh, attack on Kiev uh, takes takes place again, we will be kicked off the production line of uh, insects, uh, and again we will have to 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 do everything that we can and that everything that we can to uh, to like, to produce sufficient amount of food. Yeah, and. Unfortunately, uh, fortunately, this is the real. This is probably the biggest threat because uh, if e even if we have money, we can't buy the insects. Yeah, if we have money. At least we can buy the uh, the greens for uh, for the animals who eat fruit, vegetables, and fruits. The only thing I would like to uh, ask uh, is that um, we uh, again we don't want to, like to ask for help for nothing. Uh, we are, uh, we have launched our online project where we can share our information. I, I already told about it. 
uh, there we also gather some scientific re research papers that uh, advocates responsible herpetoculture, that advocates herpetoculture all over the world, where we share our uh, our uh, experience in the form of manuals. We also uh, make our online journal in the middle of war. <laughs> yeah, and uh, the first issue is already published. Yeah, uh, and is um, available for some level of subscription. So that was it for my call with Bayon. And again, if any of you guys are able to donate, all that information will be down in the description below. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. I'll see you guys in the next one. <laughs>